Hey everyone, Mark here. Today I'm going to be covering how to fly an ILS approach using nothing but traditional navigation techniques. I was originally going to show you how to do this with the G1000 NXI, but then I thought it might be better to show you how to do it without the magic magenta line so that you can understand what's actually going on behind the scenes, and I'll cover how to do the exact same approach with the G1000 in a subsequent video. I find it a lot more rewarding to fly the airplane like I'm about to show you in this video, but there is a lot of stuff that I need to explain, so let's get going. I'm sitting on the ground at Portland Troutdale Airport, which is just to the east of downtown Portland, and I'm going to be flying the ILS-2 runway 13 at Portland Hillsboro. The first thing I usually do when I'm flying in instruments, I'm going to have a look at the chart that I'm probably going to be using for landing, just so that I have an idea what I'm getting into. I'll be flying from the east, and the easiest way to get there from that direction is going to be to go to the Battleground VOR, from there, fly to the initial approach fix, which is marked with the letters IAF on the chart, and then from there, come around and land the approach. The first thing I'm going to do then is set the active frequency on Nav1 to the Battleground VOR, which is 116.6, since that's the transition point for the approach. I'm already picking up the signal for it. You can see its identifiers being shown right next to the frequency. So I'm going to press the course button now so it sinks the needle in the HSI to the current radial that I'm on. That way I'm going to have a rough idea of which direction I need to fly after takeoff. The ILS frequency is also indicated on the chart near the middle of it, but it's also right at the top. And I'm going to set that into my standby frequency for nav one. That way, once I'm ready to fly the approach, all I've got to do is swap it to be my active frequency in NAV1, and I'll be ready to go. And in NAV2, I'm going to set the other VOR that we need for this approach. That's the Newberg VOR with the identifier UBG. You can see it at the bottom of the chart there, and we're actually going to be using it to track our position along the approach. Because we're not going to be using the G1000's advanced features, we need to be able to see how far we are from a VOR to gauge when we can descend. I'm also going to turn on the DNE option by going into PFD options, and that's going to show me the current distance to my active frequency on the NAV1 radio. On top of that, I'm also going to set bearing 2 so that it tracks my NAV2 frequency so I can not only see the distance to it, but the direction to that Newberg VOR as well. That's going to not only allow me to very easily track my progress along the flight path, but if ever I had to do a missed approach because the visibility is too bad, I'm also going to be able to have a really good idea which direction to fly once I do abort my approach. All right, with all of that set, I should be able to navigate from takeoff all the way to the battleground VR and then onto the ILS approach. So let's fly. All right, as you can see, I'm already underway and I'm heading towards the transition point of the approach, which is the battleground VOR. Because I'm flying without the GPS's features, I don't have much of a choice but to start the approach at the battleground VOR. It's the only way that I can reliably track my position across the ground and get the initial approach fix by following the radial that's indicated on the chart. If I was flying with the GPS, the first waypoint of the approach, which is the initial approach fix, would just be loaded into my flight plan and I could just go there directly. I'm almost at the VOR now, I'm about one nautical mile short or so, so it's gonna be time to change course. As you can see on the chart, it's telling me that I need to fly the 256 radial for about 27 nautical miles, which I can monitor with the DME that I've got showing just next to the HSI. Before that though, I've got to intercept the 256 radial, and the easiest way to do that is to first turn the airplane to a heading of 256, and once that's done, I'm going to turn the course knob to 256 as well, so that right above the HSI it says 256, and then I'm going to look where the needle lands. In this case, the needle's fully deflected to the left, and I've got the autopilot in VOR mode, so it's automatically going to get me back on course. If I were flying in heading mode, I'd need to turn about 10 to 15 degrees to the left to intercept the 256 radial. And once the course needle is back in the center of the HSI, I'd turn back to a heading of 256 and just adjust for wind. If you do need a refresher on how to do VOR navigation, because I won't go into all of the details here, I've got two videos that you can check out and I'll put links to both of those in the show notes below. You can see on the chart that it also says that the initial approach fix, which is an intersection called Ducca, is going to be 29 nautical miles from the Newberg VOR, and that's the second VOR that we programmed into NAV2 before takeoff. This way I've got two ways to monitor my position across the ground. I can check my distance from the Battleground VOR as well as my distance from the Newberg VOR. 
The other thing of note on the chart is that it says for this leg of the approach, I need to stay above 4,500 feet. It's not a problem in this case because I set my cruise altitude at 4,500 because it's such a short flight. But if I was coming in from much higher, I'd start descending down to 4,500 now so that I stay one step ahead of the approach. While I've got a few seconds here, I just want to remind you really quickly to hit the like button if you haven't already and to consider subscribing as well. I publish a new video every two weeks with tips, tricks, and tutorials for newcomers to flight sim and your likes and subscribes are what keep the channel growing. All right, I've skipped forward a little bit and I'm coming up on the Ducca waypoint right now. I'm at about 28 nautical miles on Nav 2, as you can see. And if I glance over at the multifunction display, I can see the Ducca waypoint is straight ahead. The next thing that I can see on the chart is there's actually a hold at the initial approach fix. That means I'm going to need to enter the holding pattern to come back around to the intermediate fix, which is the next fix along the way. And that happens to be at the same point as the initial approach fix. What I'm going to do is keep flying past the Ducca intersection for about a minute or so. And then I'm going to do a right hand turn to make a teardrop entry into the holding pattern and try and roll out as much as possible on the inbound course of the ILS, which in this case is 128. At this point, I also need to make sure in the nav one frequency that I've set myself to the ILS, which in this case, it was already in my standby frequency. So I just had to swap it. I know that I'm in ILS mode because at the center, you can see it says localizer, which means that it's tracking the localizer signal down to the runway. While I'm doing that, you can see that the altitude restriction is 3,900 feet once I get back to the intermediate fix. So I'm going to start that descent now at the same time so that again, I'm just staying ahead of the game. Now, although I'm entering the holding pattern, I'm not actually going to fly the hold itself. The hold is really there if you had a lot of excess altitude that you had to lose. In this case, I'm already at the right altitude, so I'm just going to go right by the holding point and I'm going to continue down the path to the approach. Once I've rolled out onto a heading of 128, I need to center the localizer needle. The needle in this case, it actually represents the runway center line. So if I center the needle with the middle of the airplane, it means I'm going to be flying straight down the center line. To do that, all I do is I first see which side the needle is pointing. In this case, it's to the left. So what I'm going to do is turn my heading somewhere between 5 to 15 degrees, depending on how far deflected it is. Wait for the needle to come back towards the center. And as it moves more towards the center, I'm going to bring my course back to the final course that I need to fly of 128. Once I've intercepted the course, I of course have to stay on it the whole way down to the ground so that I end up lined up with the runway. When there's no wind, this is super easy to do because you just fly the heading that matches the course. So in this case, it'd be 128 and 128. But today, there's actually a little bit of wind pushing me to the right. So I'm going to fly a heading that's just a slight little bit to the left so that I'm grabbed into the wind and that I stay on that 128 course all the way down to the ground. At the same time as I'm lining myself up with the localizer, I need to also keep an eye on the profile view of the chart to know when and where I can descend more. It says that when I hit the 29 nautical mile mark from the UBG VOR that I can descend to 3,300 feet. It's not much lower than where I am right now, so I don't need a very aggressive descent rate. Something like 500 feet per minute will do fine because you can see I still have a fair distance to cover until I get to the next altitude step down. I skip forward a couple of seconds and once I've gone past 21.9 nautical miles on the Newberg VOR, I can descend to 2,900 feet. And you're going to notice there's a little X on the profile view at that waypoint. That's the final approach fix where we should be intercepting the glide slope if we did everything properly. And it's going to give us vertical guidance down to the minimum descent altitude. The glide slope is shown on the left hand side of the altitude tape. You can see there's a G at the top and you can also see the green diamond that's starting to come down towards the center. That diamond represents our glide path that we need to stay on. And the goal is to keep the diamond right at the center of the attitude indicator. So it should be aligned right with where the numbers are on the altimeter. The profile view also tells me that the glide slope is on a three degree angle. And I can estimate how many feet per minute that is by taking the airspeed that I'm flying, dividing it by two and adding a zero. For example, on this approach now, I'm going to be flying somewhere between 120 and 130 knots. Let's call it 120 knots just to keep things simple. 
That gives me 120 divided by 2 is 60, and I add a zero, that's going to be 600 feet per minute, which is what I'm going to use for my initial descent rate on the glide slope. Once the diamond reaches the middle of the dial, that's when I'm going to start my 600 foot per minute descent rate that we just calculated. At that point, I have to keep an eye on the diamond. If it drops below the center like it is right now, it means I'm above the ideal glide path and I have to increase my descent rate. On the other hand, if the diamond moves up on me, what I actually have to do is shallow up my descent rate because I'm actually going to be a little bit too low. While I'm intercepting the glide slope and keeping an eye on it, I also need to make sure that I'm staying aligned with the localizer. This is where using the autopilot comes in handy to hand off some of the work to the airplane to fly it because it's just a lot of stuff to do all at once. On top of all of that as well, I need to be configuring the airplane for landing. I tend to keep the speed of the airplane up until I reach the final approach fix, mostly because otherwise it takes a really long time to fly these approaches, especially if you're flying in a slower general aviation airplane. I'll usually go to the first notch of flaps once I reach the final approach fix and I'll progressively add more flaps as I continue to descend towards the runway and my goal is usually to be at full flaps just before I get to the minimum descent altitude. Speaking of the MDA, it is probably a good time to have a look to see what it actually is for this approach. In this case, it's going to be 403 feet regardless of the airplane category that I'm flying. So once I reach 400 feet, that's where I'm going to level off and have a look if I can spot the runway. If I can see it clearly, I'm going to continue my approach and go in for landing. And if I can't see it and I continue to fly past the airport and I still haven't spotted it, that's when I'm going to have to execute the go around procedure. The go around has me going to the Newburgh VOR directly and then doing a hold, which if you'll remember, that's why we actually set it in our bearing too, so that if I do have to abort, I immediately know which way to turn and I can immediately go to the Newburgh VOR and figure out what I'm going to do from there. I seem to have broken out of the clouds at this point and I can pretty clearly see the runway. So at this point, I'm just going to disable the autopilot and I'm going to fly the airplane down to the ground myself. You can actually see I went a little bit too low once I disabled the autopilot and I had to reduce my descent rate a little bit to make sure to get back to the glide path. Otherwise, I'm going to be coming in a little bit too low and touch down before the touchdown zone. That's pretty much going to cover it though for how to fly an ILS with traditional instruments down to the runway. Uh, like I said in the opening, I'll soon release how to do the exact same flight but with the G1000 features and I'll link to that one at the end of this video once that one's published. I hope you learned something useful during this flight, and if you did, make sure to hit the like button and consider subscribing as well. See you soon.